Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a great uh, pleasure to return to Toronto and my collaboration with uh, Michael and close friendship, as well as many uh, other individuals at the University of Toronto Health uh, System. I'm going to discuss how do we stratify uh, risk in patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and when might we use non-statin therapies to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease in very high-risk individuals. These are my uh, disclosures. Following the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association secondary prevention guidelines, there's been an increase in utilization of statin therapy post-myocardial infarction. This is our work from MarketScan, a large national commercial database, as well as uh, Medicare, a government-sponsored uh, program that uh, ensures uh, seniors. Although uh, high-intensity statins are uh, increasing, uh, the percentage of individuals receiving high-intensity statin therapy after myocardial infarction still remains lower than we would like. Fortunately, individuals who have a myocardial infarction who are on high-intensity statins remain on high-intensity statins, but they're still having infarcts. And this raises the question, what else can we do to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease in those individuals? The recent 2018 cholesterol guidelines identified two groups of individuals, a very high-risk population and a high-risk population. For very high-risk individuals, which I'll define momentarily, it is recommended that they receive high-intensity statins to lower the LDL cholesterol less than 70 milligram per deciliter. For high-risk individuals, it's recommended that they achieve a 50% reduction or more in their LDL cholesterol on a high-intensity statin or for a moderate intensity statin, 30 to 50 percent. But we can see that one group is very high risk, one group is high risk, but are the targets different and should they be different? Very high risk individual by the uh, guideline is somebody with a recent acute coronary syndrome, a history of an MI before the more recent acute coronary syndrome, ischemic stroke, and lower extremity arterial disease. High-risk conditions, older age, heterozygous FH, a history of prior coronary uh, revascularization, diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, current smoking, persistently elevated LDL cholesterol on a statin and azetamide, or a prior history of congestive heart failure. But how high is the risk in those individuals? The guideline fell short in providing us these numbers. We had the opportunity to explore this in Medicare participants who had a myocardial infarction and a revascularization procedure. These were individuals who had evidence-based treatment that constituted high-intensity statins, beta blocker, ACE or ARB, or a prescription antiplatelet uh, agent. We compared the risk of these post-MI patients on optimal medical therapy to the general population in a population of diabetes patients without clinical coronary heart disease. There's about 25,000 individuals uh, who had uh, myocardial infarctions and fulfilled those criteria. In the left-hand column, compared to the general population, if you had a myocardial infarction and you're optimally treated, your risk for recurrent MI is increased 8.5-fold. Your risk for a coronary heart disease event increased 7.8-fold and your risk of dying has increased 1.15-fold. Compared to somebody with diabetes, uh, individuals who had a myocardial infarction, much higher risk for recurrent cardiovascular events, and they tended to die more, although it wasn't significant. And compared to people with coronary disease who haven't had an infarct, uh, the risks again remain high. So this concept that we implement evidence-based therapies and we can bring somebody down to a healthy state is really misguided. Current work that uh, is being uh, led by uh, Michael is looking at um, uh, market scan, and we're seeing uh, similar strong signals, and we'll present that data at the European Society of Cardiology meeting uh, this uh, August. If we focus on the myocardial infarction population, if you had prior coronary disease, just focusing on the uh, light uh, blue on the left, your risk of uh, having a recurrent event 
a myocardial infarction is doubled. The same if you have a myocardial infarction diabetes, doubled, chronic kidney disease, about a doubling, and heart failure, a doubling. For stroke, there's a higher mortality rate, and similarly for prior heart failure before the uh, uh, index uh, event. So within a myocardial infarction population, we can identify high-risk characteristics and provide some numbers on what the guidelines suggested were high-risk criteria. So the guideline recommends statin therapy, consider non-statin therapy, and I will now move into uh, that area. This is a schematic from a paper we published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology uh, last year that talks about proprotein Converte Subtilisin uh, Connexin 9 inhibitors, PCSK9, a mouthful. A circulating protein that binds to LDL particles. And when those PCSK9 bound LDL particles dock to the LDL receptor, it's a death signal. Those PCSK9 bound LDL particles in the LDL receptor in, are incorporated in the endosome, go to the lysosome, and that degrades the LDL receptor. That means the LDL receptor doesn't come back to the surface of the liver to grab more cholesterol out of the bloodstream. And so inhibiting PCSK9 may be an option to allow for the greater activity of the LDL receptor and allow for more clearance of the LDL particles. What are the approaches? Fully human monoclonal antibodies on the market. A humanized uh, antibody was tested by Pfizer, Bocosixumab, and it failed because of um, autoantibodies that diminished the effect of that agent on its LDL cholesterol lowering. There's RNA interference and antisense therapy under uh, development. In this uh, schematic, we contrast these two different approaches. If you have a human monoclonal antibody, the uh, blood levels of uh, PCSK9 will increase because you've got the antibody binding um, to the uh, protein, and you can detect this in the serum. The approach in the uh, plaque is, or would be that you block the PCSK9 action in the atheroma. In contrast, the small interfering uh, RNA will decrease the levels of PCSK9 and result in uh, uh, reduced PCSK9 levels uh, in the atheroma, as shown in the uh, bottom uh, uh, right uh, uh, panel. What are the trials? You're familiar with these, I'm certain. The Odyssey Outcome Study was a post-ACS population, individuals with LDL cholesterol levels greater than or equal to 70 milligram per deciliter, or high non-HDL cholesterol, or high APOB, on high-intensity statins. They were randomized to receive alirocumab, versus uh, placebo, about uh, 18,000 individuals. A busy slide, but it basically just uh, makes the point um, that uh, the uh, average LDL cholesterol on high-intensity statins was elevated at 87 uh, milligram uh, per deciliter. About 89% were receiving those high-intensity uh, statins. Some individuals were receiving a lower-intensity statin, but it was considered maximally tolerated or during the run-in, they down-titrated the uh, statin. The main point is that the primary outcome was reduced by uh, an absolute event rate of 2.0%, or relatively 22%, and uh, that uh, is a very important finding. We look at some of the uh, secondary outcomes. We're seeing reduction in hospitalization for unstable angina, reductions in ischemic uh, stroke, and in a uh, um, tertiary endpoint, a reduction in all-cause mortality. The asterisk is uh, cited there because uh, it was a hierarchical approach that required reduction in coronary disease mortality, and that wasn't met. And so one, uh, you know, statistically looks at that with some skepticism, but if fewer people die, I think that's uh, an important uh, observation, obviously better than going the other way. The Fourier trial was a study of people with stable coronary disease, uh, individuals that were on high-intensity statins. Subsequently, the protocol design was changed for moderate-intensity statins, and uh, they were randomized to another fully human monoclonal antibody, evolucumab versus placebo. In this study, dropping uh, 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 down, we can see the uh, uh, about 70% were on uh, high-intensity uh, statins. 
the average LDL cholesterol, uh, 92 uh, milligram uh, per deciliter. The primary endpoint was also reduced by 2% over 36 uh, months, and an expanded endpoint um, uh, was reduced again by 2%. But with regards to the focus of my talk is that human monoclonal antibodies are expensive technique and we can't uh, prescribe them to every individual even though we might want to. And the question is how can we learn from large data, how can we learn from clinical trials, who might derive the greatest benefit from those therapies? So I'll talk about some of these subgroup analysis from Fourier, discuss the time to the qualifying event, the number of prior MIs, multivessel coronary disease, and multivascular atherosclerotic coronary disease. If you had an MI within the preceding two years, your event rate is higher at 10.8 percent versus having an event, uh, you know, uh, later at 9.3 percent, the absolute benefit of a PCSK9 inhibitor was larger. The more myocardial infarctions you have, the greater the risk of having a recurrent event, 15 percent versus 8.2 percent. The benefit of a PCSK9 inhibitor was greater. Having multivessel disease, your event rate was higher at 12.6 percent versus without, 8.9 percent. The benefit of the therapy was greater. Having peripheral arterial disease, your event rate was much higher at 13 percent versus not having peripheral vascular disease, 7.6 percent. And the absolute benefit of PCSK inhibitor was substantially larger. And this is very consistent with our data in market scan that, again, we'll be presenting at the European Society of Cardiology in two uh, oral sessions at that uh, meeting. Adverse limb events, that means uh, amputation, gangrene, um, infections, again, were reduced with PCSK9 uh, inhibitor. So those are vascular-specific uh, conditions. Other uh, risk modifying factors are listed here, and I'm going to uh, you know, focus on uh, some of those without reading through this uh, long uh, list, uh, which you can refer to in the uh, 2018 guideline. In data that was presented uh, last year at the American Society of Nephrology, patients with impaired uh, renal function have higher rates of cardiovascular events. And the benefits of evolucumab therapy are larger in people with impaired kidney function. Why is this so important? Because statins have failed in most of the studies of people with advanced kidney disease to reduce cardiovascular events. And so this raises the question, why did PCSK9 inhibitors provide such large absolute benefit? This is the uh, schematic of a forthcoming uh, editorial that's written in collaboration with uh, David Cherney and uh, Patrick Lawler where we hypothesize that unlike statins, which lower LDL cholesterol and VLDL cholesterol, PCSK9 inhibitors lower lipoprotein A. The more severe the renal impairment, the higher the lipoprotein A level. And it's so, it may be that reducing that highly potent atherogenic lipoprotein may explain some of the additional benefit in the PCSK9 inhibitor trial. Certainly a dedicated study in patients with chronic kidney disease compared to, uh, you know, therapy with statin and ezetimibe uh, needs to be uh, conducted. And I say statin plus ezetimibe because of the uh, SHARP uh, trial. What about diabetes, an area that uh, you folks know a lot about, uh, Michael's work, uh, long duration of diabetes, microalbuminuria, impaired renal function, microvascular disease, retinopathy, neuropathy, and having peripheral arterial disease. Individuals with diabetes, higher event rates than those without. As I've discussed, the absolute benefit is greater. Fewer people need to be treated. Clearly a risk enhancer. Last week, our uh, paper, the Banting trial, appeared in di uh, Diapatologia. This was a dedicated study of diabetes patients on moderate high intensity stands who had elevated LDL cholesterol uh, levels. They were randomized to evolucumab versus placebo. We looked at uh, fasting and postprandial uh, lipid and lipoprotein concentrations. The randomization was two to one, PCSK9 inhibitor versus uh, placebo. Very busy slide, but it's basically just making the point that we've got, uh, you know, 46% uh, women, well represented, 72% uh, Caucasian, 
uh, high intensity stands used in 51% uh, moderate intensity stands, 47%, a high risk population with regards to uh, insulin uh, use. The average LDL cholesterol, 2.86 millimole per liter. Um, they could get in also for a high non HDL cholesterol. The uh, major point is that looking at uh, weeks 10 and 12, which are the peak effect of the PCSK9 and the trough effect, averaging the two, um, there was a reduction with a volcumab of 65% in LDL cholesterol, a reduction of 57% non-HDL cholesterol, ApoB reduced by 50%, lipoprotein A by, fell by 31%. There were reductions in triglyceride, increases in HDL cholesterol, reductions in VLDL cholesterol, no change in uh, hemoglobin A1C, and no change in glucose. Why is this important? Because genetic loss of function mutations, different than a fully human monoclonal antibody, have shown increased rates of diabetes. Patients have been concerned about whether they go on this therapy and they have more diabetes. But one has to realize that the increased risk of diabetes is because there are loss of function variants at, that affect pancreatic uh, uptake via the LDL receptor and result in beta cell toxicity. This is something that doesn't happen with a human monoclonal antibody, which is not entering into the pancreas. It's a circulating human monoclonal antibody. It doesn't get into the tissues. Now, whether we're gonna see an increase in diabetes with small interfering RNA is an unresolved uh, question. But that's why we need to dis distinguish between Mendelian randomization studies versus human monoclonal antibodies. They're not necessarily the same. Busy slide, but it's interesting uh, in our trial that we saw a decrease in postprandial triglycerides, uh, chylomicron triglyceride, chylomicron uh, cholesterol, and ApoB48, which is the, uh, you know, the major protein on uh, the chylomicrons, the intestinally derived lipoproteins. And why might this happen with a PCSK9 inhibitor? Because you're upregulating the LDL receptor, and it's not a receptor that just recognizes LDL, it's the ApoBE receptor. And what do the remnants have? A lot of ApoE. And so we hypothesize that there's greater clearance via the ApoE mechanism on postprandial lipoproteins. In the last uh, segment, I'll just talk about um, inflammation, an area that uh, we've been involved in for many years, do a lot of work in uh, HIV, certainly a risk enhancer. And uh, we're uh, just uh, completed enrollment of uh, the Bajernik trial, which we'll uh, probably be presenting, um, you know, in a year at the American College of Cardiology meeting, uh, looking at lipids and inflammation. But what about inflammation and what about PCSK9 inhibitors? You've heard uh, many uh, individuals say these are pure LDL cholesterol lowering drugs. They don't reduce inflammation because there's no change in CRP. CRP is a systemic acute phase reactant synthesized by the liver. But in the experimental uh, models, uh, there are, is increased PCSK9 expression in the post-circulation zones, the areas where there's increased oscillatory shear stress. And uh, the PCSK9 in uh, different uh, cells, be it the mononuclear cells and dendritic cells, is uh, increasing uh, PCSK9. And there's also an increase in inf inflammation. So why is there a disconnect? That's something that we're trying to explore. But before I get into an ongoing uh, uh, trial, it's important to know that PCSK9 doesn't just affect the LDL uh, receptor. It affects the LDL superfamily, which includes uh, ApoER2 over here um, and here, LDLR, and then the uh, um, the uh, lectin oxidized LDL receptor. And it may be the effects on the dendritic cells where uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors are showing their action, as well as in the mononuclear cells. And we've uh, just launched the Mechnikoff trial, which is a trial evaluating PCSK9 inhibitor versus placebo in patients with coronary disease, diabetes, and looking at bio and cellular inflammatory pathways stimulating uh, cells ex vivo with seven different toll receptors, looking at signaling pathways, detailed proteomics to try and get some mechanistic understanding that will help uh, merge the experimental models 
with some of the base, uh, uh, you know, in the basic science that we're seeing. To summarize, we have a treatment algorithm that's focused on LDL cholesterol. I think it's very important to recognize that both the Odyssey outcome study and the IMPROVE-IT trial used a dose escalation approach that if the LDL cholesterol was above 50 to 55 uh, milligram per deciliter, they intensified the therapy. We feel that very high-risk individuals, because of their enhanced risk, would derive more benefit from lowering the LDL cholesterol to less than 55 milligram uh, per deciliter. And some of the emerging clinical trial data from the Fourier trial, the subgroup analysis, supports our uh, uh, contention. So to summarize, I think that we can do a better job with uh, utilization of resources by taking some of the uh, guideline uh, data, the large data, and the data from clinical trials to better identify who's at very high risk versus low risk and be smart about utilization of our uh, resources. And uh, that way, I think we can help uh, more people at the more reasonable cost. Thank you very much. Thank you.